We are kicking off a new series today. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at this series entitled The Escape Plan. And the reality is, when it comes to our lives as humans and as believers, we all face a trap of the enemy on a consistent basis. And it's a, a specific trap that we may sometimes give into that can derail us. It can even potentially cause us to lose our faith in Christ or to walk away from our relationship with him and even in our relationships with others whom we need. And just like and in your workplace or in certain buildings that you may enter or even in your home, you may have an escape plan in the event of an emergency or life-threatening situation. Spiritually speaking, Jesus addressed the trap of the enemy that you and I face. And we have to be aware of it. We have to guard ourselves against it. And so we're going to look at what that is because God always gives us a way out. He is so faithful to make a way where there is no way because we serve the God of the impossible. And he makes a way for us, even in this specific trap, so that we know how to escape it. Here's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 17, 1 through 5. I encourage you to read with me. Luke writes, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone who, through who, whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, as we finished our non-negotiable series last Sunday, we looked at this verse and talked about this increasing our faith. And that really needs to be our heart as believers is, Lord, help me to grow in my faith. Help me to, to have an authentic faith in you, Jesus, according to Hebrews eleven six, because that's what you call me to as a believer, as your follower. And Jesus is saying here that things are bound to happen. In other words, in the Greek, the word really that Jesus uses are offenses. Offenses are bound to come. And they cause people to stumble in their faith. They cause people to stumble in their relationship with God or even in their relationship with others. And if we're honest with ourselves, many times we feel like some offenses are huge obstacles that we can't get past, if we're honest with ourselves. But here's the reality, is that church, there is no offense that is too great to overcome because God created an escape plan. Amen. And again, offenses we all deal with. We're all confronted with them on a regular basis in our life. And here's what I want you to know this morning, going with that first point, is that avoiding an offense is impossible, according to what Jesus was saying. But living offended is a choice. I'm going to say that again because we all need to get that. Avoiding an offense is impossible, but living offended is a choice. Even this week... I know you may think highly of me. Even this week as I was driving down this road that was 45 miles an hour, there was a car that probably shouldn't have turned out in front of me. How many of you know what I'm talking about and you've been there? And then they go 30 to 35 miles an hour for a couple miles down this road. It was two lane road, so I really couldn't pass at certain points. So I had to, I was stuck. And in that moment, I started to get frustrated, right? You guys are all smiling at me. You can't see yourselves, but I can see you right now. You're smiling at me because you know you've been there. And I began to get frustrated, like, come on, I need to get somewhere, at least go the speed limit. 
I'm not asking you to speed erratically and to get crazy on the road now. I'm just, I just want you to go 45 miles an hour. And in that moment, I was offended by this other driver. We've all been there. I can't tell you how many times, and you already know, that we have opportunities to be offended by many different people. And Jesus said, you're going to be offended in this life. It's impossible to avoid the offense and offenses. Things are going to happen to you, but don't get derailed. Don't allow the devil to lie to you so that you think you can't get past the offense because it's too great or too big to overcome. Don't think that way is what Jesus was trying to communicate because God created an escape plan for us from the offense. He made a way for us to not take on the offense and to live with it, but to bypass it or to step over it so that we don't live offended. It got quiet in here. I must be hitting home. I must have heard the Lord right when he said, this is what I want you to preach on in this series. Because when things do happen to us in life, when an offense occurs, Satan wants us to be tripped up. And the word Jesus used in this scripture, again, is offense. And in the Greek, the word is scandalon. I have it there on your outline for you. And the word scandalon in the Greek means this. It means the trigger of a trap on which bait is placed, and when touched, it causes entrapment. Scandalon refers to the part of the trap on which, again, the bait is set. And it's signifying that a trap is being placed in someone or something's path. You know, there's many traps that we are familiar with in life. There's, there's a mouse trap, and I have one here this morning. It's actually already locked and loaded. And you're familiar with this, if you've ever placed one of these, or maybe you have one of, the, one of the little boxes where the mouse can get into the box and then can't get out. It's drawn in by the bait, right? On these, you can put a piece of cheese, and just like that, the mouse is done for. Maybe you ha have an ant trap, and the ant trap will draw in the ants, and then they take it back to the colony to kill the rest of the ants, or we have something like a zapper. You've seen one of these. Maybe you have one of these at your home where flies or other bugs are drawn to the light. Go to the light. <laughs> Go to that light. That's paradise. And they get to the light and bzz, their life is over. And we're like, yes, we won again. <laughs> Maybe you're a, f a fisherman or a fisherwoman. And I'm going to be careful not to poke and get caught on this because that would be a painful sermon. But these we place to catch some good fish. If you've ever gone fishing and you place bait on the hook, could be a worm. It could be something else that they like, a specific fish longs for. And we get the fish. And there's many different types of traps. And in fact, even I have this, I have a, a fish net where if you've seen one of these where you place it in the water and the fish can swim in one end and they get caught or stuck and they can't get out. And you pull it up and then you're able to have some fish that way. There's a, another type of trap that I want you to see and I, I, I'm going to have it on the screen for you. Would you guys put that up for me? You guys know what that trap kind of trap is, right? It's the Vaughn Trap family. And if you were to enter their home, you'd be trapped by their music or the sound of music, right? But seriously, then there's one last trap I want to show you on the screen. And this is a bear trap. And it's, it's about this size and width, and it has claws in, in the center. And then there's a metal piece in the middle where you put the bait, you put the food that will draw the bear in. And when the bear comes and it puts it, its paw or its snaws in its nose in there, it traps them. And the bear is done for. And I want you to keep that picture in your mind as we're talking about this series of the bait of Satan 
the trap of the enemy and how God has an escape plan for us. And when you look at that and talking about even a bear, here's the point on that, is that it doesn't matter how strong you think you are, how big or important you think you may be, because when you go for the bait of the enemy, it will entrap you just like a bear becomes trapped and is done for. And sometimes we think in life that I'm not going to get taken out by a trap, by the trap of, of, of offense or some other snare of the enemy. And yet Satan's out, Jesus said, to kill, steal, and destroy our lives in any way that he can. And so my encouragement to you, and here's the point that I want to make to you this morning, is don't take the bait of the enemy that brings you into captivity. Don't take the bait. It's so easy because the bait always looks enticing for one reason or another. Again, for the mouse, it's the cheese. It's appealing. For fish, it's worms or other bait. For the bear, it's a certain type of food that draws them into captivity. And Jesus said, again, Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy our lives. And he will do it in any way possible. And that's why Jesus said in this passage that we just read, he said, watch yourselves. In other words, be on guard, be aware of the trap of the enemy. And of all the ways that Satan can destroy us, the trap of offense may be his most hidden. We may not feel like an offense from somebody is from Satan, but, the, but be rest assured, if we take that bait, it will lead us into living offended, which is a life of captivity, not freedom that Jesus came to bring us. And there's a great resource. If you've not read this book as a believer, I encourage you to, to find it, to read it. It's called The Bait of Satan, and it's a book by John Bevere, and it's so well written. We've done even small group studies here at Propel, and every believer should read it because, again, we all face this temptation, this trap of the enemy. And it starts off as one little offense, but the enemy wants to take it so that it grows in our life. And that's what we're going to be talking about. If we give in to feeling offended and we take on that offense, we then begin to take on other offenses if we've taken on one offense. And at some point, we can begin to feel like everyone is out to get us. And then our offenses affect our life in every area and they affect all of our relationships. Again, Jesus said we can't avoid offense, but we can choose not to live offended. But the choice is ours, whether we take the bait or whether we step over it or bypass it. Jesus gave us a part of the escape plan in verses three and four, where really he's saying by choosing to forgive and love, we avoid the destructive trap in our lives. Instead of taking on the offense, we step over it or bypass the offense by choosing to forgive the offense and, and love the person. And by doing so, you and I avoid the destructive trap of the enemy who wants to destroy our life and our relationship with Jesus and with others. Here's what Solomon writes in Proverbs 17, 9. He says, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. When the moment an offense comes our way, if we foster that, if we hold on to it or we make uh, the choice rather to love, when we love instead of holding on to that offense, we not only protect ourselves from the devil's trap, but we're making the choice to keep healthy relationships. And at times this is easier said than done. I'm not trying to just downplay the offense. Because offenses can be sometimes hard to get past. They're hard to let go. But again, life is all about choices. And it's no different in following Jesus. We have choices to make. That's why Jesus said every single day as believers, we've got to deny our flesh what our flesh wants to do. We, our flesh wants to hang on to the offense. And if we hang on to the offense, it will begin to grow. And we'll take on other offenses. And soon we'll be, we'll be, we'll be living offended in our life. But understand that the Lord is faithful to help us 
in those moments where it seems too difficult that we can't get past the offense. Even when it comes to small and big ways, or even in painful ways, painful offenses. Again, sometimes people cut us off in driving. And yet we have a choice to make just to not become offended in that moment, to let it go, to pray over them, to bless them. Could be with those that are closest to us. And we'll talk a little bit more of that in a moment, but we have a choice to make when we are experiencing an offense in all different sizes and ways. And maybe you're thinking while I'm talking here, but pastor, you don't know what happened to me when I was a child when someone took my innocence. Or pastor, you don't know what my spouse did to me that betrayed me. Or pastor, you don't know what someone took from me, stole from me in a different way. And you're right, I may not know what happened to you, And I want you to hear it today that I'm sorry for every hurt and offense that you've experienced in your life. That's not God's heart. That was never God's intention. That was never his plan. And because he's given us free will as humans, humans make wrong choices and wrong behavior that affects negatively in others' lives. And the Father wants you to know today that he's sorry for that hurt, for that offense that you've experienced. But he also wants you to find freedom from that. That's why Jesus came. And I want you to know, and I think the Lord wants you to know today that God saw what happened to you. And in those moments of pain, he cried for you and with you. And he does not condone sin. He does not condone wrong behavior or speech. But again, if we make the choice to hold on to our fences, we only hurt ourselves in the process, which is the trap of the enemy. And with God's help and the escape plan of choosing to forgive and love, we avoid the personal destructive trap that Satan lays out before every one of us. That's why to live in the freedom that Jesus came to bring our lives, we cannot take the bait that leads us into captivity. The Apostle Paul encouraged his son in the faith, Timothy, in how to live and what to teach the church. And here's what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. He says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. In the context of offense, here's a summary point of these three verses. Offenses lead to quarrels which trap us to fulfill the devil's plan. When we take the bait, when we give in to an offense and we become offended, tension is now created between us and that person. And that offense with another person or group of people potentially leads to quarrels or disputes in the relationship. And those disputes or quarrels, which are ultimately the trap and the plan of the devil, as we begin to do his will, as Paul says. You see, the enemy doesn't have to stir up chaos. All he has to do is to get us to take the bait. Because then we'll do his work, his plan for him as we live offended between us and another person. And then we mistake, we misunderstand everything that they say, whether it's truth or not, and they, vice versa, do the same to us. And as long as there's this tension, the enemy's sitting back going, ha ha, I've won. And that's why Jesus talked about we have to watch ourselves as believers. We have to be on guard against the trap of the enemy because we all face this temptation to take the bait of offense in our lives. If we become offended, it will cause us to view that person through a lens of distrust and it will affect our thoughts, our words, our actions towards that person. And finally, we can no longer get along with them because of what they've done. 
And yet Paul tells us that when we're offended, when we've been wronged, we must gently correct or instruct them and hope that they will repent, which leads them to the truth and the error of their ways. In other words, so that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil. Because God always makes a way of escape. Now understand that the offender can be caught in the devil's trap to do his will or his plan, but also can be the one who's offended that can be caught to do the devil's trap and plan. Either way, it's not the Lord's heart and plan for us as believers, and it hurts us personally. Yes. It hurts us personally more than it hurts the other people. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 14, and 15. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. As the scripture tells us that we can't even see the Lord, we can't even experience permanent salvation in heaven for eternity without living holy lives. Now, that word sometimes scares us, like, because I can't live holy. How can I live up to that? But really, holiness is broken down to obedience to Jesus. If you've accepted Jesus in your heart and life as Savior and Lord, you're choosing to live for him as a, his follower, you're going to make mistakes still in this life. But we are choosing to go, God, I want to be obedient in everything. And God's grace and forgiveness is there. It's already been paid for on the cross, according to 1 John 1, 9, that when we do sin, we repent of our sin and confess it to God and we turn from it and we get back up and we start walking with Christ and his blood covers that sin, but then also we're choosing to be obedient in every area of our life. And when we're obedient to the Lord, the Father sees us as righteous, the Bible says. But the Bible here also tells us to make every single effort on our part to live in peace with everyone. And to live a holy and pleasing life to God because that's our responsibility. And with this, we're to see to it, or in other words, it's our responsibility to make sure that we don't allow any bitter root to grow in our heart, our life, which defiles us and brings many problems to our life. Meaning if we take an offense, we hold on to it, we continue to think about it, we even begin to think, well, how could they? I, I just can't believe that they could have done that. If we live that way and we don't release it to the Lord, we don't choose to love and forgive, it will begin to grow. It starts off as a little seed, but then it becomes a root. And it begins to defile our life, begins to bring on many problems in our life. And here's the point, is that any time we hold on to an offense, any time, we allow bitterness into our heart that negatively affects our life and relationship with Jesus and others. Any time. When someone offends us and we hold on to it instead of stepping over it or bypassing it, we allow a seed, a bitterness into our heart that if not dealt with will turn into a root of bitterness that will negatively impact our life as well as our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with others. In other words, let me say it this way, church, just to paint a clearer picture, even more so, is that bitterness is a poison and it's dangerous because it negatively impacts our entire life. The Bible talks about it being as like a wall or a fortress that we put up in our mind and our heart, in our, through our thoughts, through our offenses, we can take and hold on to that, not releasing it to the Lord, not choosing to love and forgive, and we dwell on that. It becomes a wall or a fortress in our mind, and that's where we hide behind it. And biblically, it's called a stronghold. 
And that's why strongholds can be difficult to break apart from God's escape plan, as we see even in Proverbs 18, 19, which says, a brother wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city. Disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. This verse says that when someone takes on offense, they're like a fortified city that won't budge. They put up a wall in their heart, in their mind, against that person, against that situation, and they won't, they won't budge. They won't move. It's like the old visual picture in that culture in that day when there was a city that was built with a, a wall around it to protect it. You're protecting yourself from others is what you think you're doing. But in the spiritual context, we only hurt ourselves when we build up walls in our mind and heart. Disputes, conflicts, and disagreements don't accomplish anything, but they continue because of the offense. They don't go away when we hold on to an offense. David wrote Psalm 55, and here's what it says in verses 12 through 14 regarding offenses. He says, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. I want you to think about that and process what that verse is telling us because David says here that I can handle my enemy's offense toward me. And I think we can all identify with that. If there's somebody that is against us and we know they're against us, if they insult us, if they offend us, if they're trying to attack us in some way, we get it. We understand I can put up with that. I can deal with that. Lord, I just love them and bless them and pray for them. But when my close friend... And my spiritual companion, he says, who's someone he went and worshiped with at the house of God, side by side, doing life together as believers, as followers of God. They worship the Lord together. And now my friend, my close companion offended me. It is much more difficult to overcome my offense, is what David was saying. And here's the point, is that the closer the relationship the more intense the offense. The closer the relationship we have with others, the more intense the offense. Right? We would all agree that we're hurt the most by those closest to us, starting with our spouses. Right? I can't tell you how many times I've ticked off Julie. <laughs> because we know each other inside and out and as much as we love Jesus, both of us, with all of our hearts, our soul, our mind, our strength, as much as we do that, we're still human. We still speak in a wrong tone of voice at times to one another. Or we respond in a certain way. Or we don't respond. Whatever it is, we can offend each other. And it, there's more chance of that happening on a regular basis because we live together. How many of you tracking with me? It's, okay, you're with me. Okay, I'm not the only one. You guys are looking at me like, man, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. I never experienced that. Or even with our kids, there's opportunities for offenses and how our kids respond. And if my kids were like so-and-so's kids, it'd be all better. That's the lie of the enemy. Or... Our neighbors, our coworkers, even close friends or close family relationships. When we love somebody dearly and then they offend us, it hurts deep. It hurts deep. At the same time, we can offend others. We can hurt others who are close to us. And we may not even realize it. And we're always concerned about what's been done to us, but we're not as concerned maybe about what we've done to others. Understand this, that every disagreement begins with an offense. Whether there was an actual offense from somebody towards you, or it was an interpretation or a thought that you had that you felt offended, 
in some way. But every disagreement begins with an offense, whether in a marriage, whether in family or friendships, even with our fellow believers. And Satan wants us to give in to his plan of disunity, his plan of chaos, of disagreements by taking the bait of offense and living offended. And yet the Bible is telling us this, is that don't be surprised at who can offend us. Don't be shocked by it. Sometimes we're just so shocked in life by it. How could they? Especially when we love somebody so close. Sometimes we're taken aback or surprised at those who offend us. Look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. He says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Now, we are living in the last days. And I'm not just saying that to say that, but according to what the Bible says in the seasons and times that we're living in, and we see it taking place in the world today, what we just read. And Paul says, mark this, or in other words, expect these things to happen in the last days. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be surprised. Be on guard. And he says, the last days will be terrible. And it, ultimately, if you look at, and read the, in the book of Revelation, I believe after Jesus returns for the body of Christ, the church, and the rapture, it's only going to get worse. We see that. But here, Timothy, or Paul rather, lists off the characteristics of these people. And when you look at these characteristics from the context of offense, every one of these characteristics will cause offense towards others. Selfishness offends other people, right? Love of money offends others because people protect what they love. If someone's boastful, proud, and abusive, they will offend people. If there's children that are disobedient to their parents, they're going to offend them. If there's children or others that are ungrateful and unholy, there's going to be offense towards people. If someone doesn't love, they won't forgive and they slander, it's going to offend somebody. If there's no self-control, there's brutal uh, behavior and, and they don't do what's right, they're going to offend. If they're treacherous, rash, and conceited, they're going to offend others. If they please self instead of loving God, they're going to offend people because God is not number one in their heart and life. We already see this mentality in the world today, but then Paul goes on to say these people, you need to get this, have a form of godliness. In other words, they will say or try to appear as though they're Christian, as though they follow Christ, as though they are followers of Jesus on the outside of our life, but their lifestyle and their behavior denies the power of what a true believer should look like. Come on, somebody. We have a nation of people who still claim to be Christian that are not living the lifestyle of a Christian. And we see these characteristics play out. And Paul tells us to have nothing to do with these people. Not because we're not supposed to love them, not because we're not supposed to pray for them, not because we're supposed to not share the gospel with them because that's what we are supposed to do but we don't associate with them or spend our time with them because their behavior and processes may rub off on us. Yes, we're called to love them. That's, that's our command from Jesus himself. And so we're going to love them, we're going to speak truth, we're going to pray, but we can't spend our time with them as believers because their behavior may rub off on us and we can take on other offenses. The point is, all of those characteristics we should expect in the time that we're living in. Don't be surprised by who we're going to be offended by. We've seen it even in 2020. Because of all that we're going through in our nation, in our world, people were quickly offended. Even on social media. If social media offends you, then don't be on social media. 
Don't take the bait. And it could be something else. It could, another thing could bait you more than it could bait me. I don't know. But you've got to be aware of that and don't take the bait. Paul gives us truth, rather, on how we should live as a follower of Jesus in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And he goes on to talk about how this is how Christ lived, and we're supposed to live like Jesus, to follow his footsteps. But in these two verses, he's, he's really talking about pride at first. Selfish ambition or vain conceit is all about self. It's pride. When we live in pride, we will offend others. But when we live in humility as Jesus did, we will look to value others and build up others instead of self. And when we do that, there's less chance to offend somebody, right? If we're looking to build them up, encourage them in the Lord, to we see their value, and we want to build value into them, there's going to be less chance to be offended when they say something towards us because, you know what, we're going to let it go because I love them and I want the Lord to do something in their heart and life. And the reality is whether we offend others or we're offended by others, pride keeps us a victim of being offended rather than seeing how possibly we offended others. A lot of times, again, we're looking at, oh, I can't believe they said that. I can't believe my spouse said that or they did that to me or they didn't do that or how could they? Or any other relationship that we have. Pride keeps us from the truth of admitting and dealing with our condition of pride. And sometimes we don't think as believers we have pride, but I would say sometimes we do. We're just not aware of it. And pride can come out in different ways. Pride keeps us living as a victim, thinking everybody's out to get us or we get offended at every little thing. That's why we must live in humility, as the Bible tells us, so that we can love others and not take on offense. Understand, church, that pride is also a blind spot in our lives as we can't see how we offended others. Many times we don't see how we offended others. We'd only see, again, how we've been offended. And whether we offended somebody else intentionally or unintentionally, we all offend somebody else at some point. That's the reality. I've offended people, and I've had to go back and apologize for what I said or how I said it or what I did or whatever because I was wrong. If we're prideful, we probably won't see how we've offended others and why we need the Lord's help and those closest to us to point out our blind spot because we all have blind spots in our life at times. Solomon says in Proverbs 19, 11, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. We are wise when we live in and when we show patience with others. By overlooking their offense, God says we're living in wisdom. But when we take the bait of offense, we're not representing Jesus well and the offense will only negatively, again, impact our life our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with others as we remain a victim of pride. Again, how could they? How could they have done that to me? Well, look at Jesus' life. No, but a lot of people didn't believe in him. A lot of people betrayed him. A lot of people mocked him, persecuted him, and eventually killed him. He gave up his life for us, for you and I. But make no mistake, they put him on the cross. And if Jesus can live a life without having pride, then he's called us to live that life without living in pride, to live in humility before the Lord. I want to close this message by looking at Matthew chapter 24. The disciples had asked Jesus, what are the signs of the end times and when he was going to return? And here's what Jesus responds with. He says, watch out so that no one deceives you because many will come in my name. And he goes on to talk about some things, but I want to focus on verses 10 through 14. And here's what he says in those verses. He says, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. 
Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I want to read verse 10 out of the New King James Version. Because it says it this way. It says, And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Notice the word many, both in the NIV and in the New King James Version. Not some, not few, but many will be offended. Which causes them or will cause them to turn away from their faith as the NIV says. Here's the reality is that once a believer or once someone is offended, there's a progression that happens. And Jesus talked about it here. It says, then they will betray their relationships. Whether they betray the Lord or they betray others. And they will begin to hate each other at some point. When somebody has taken on the offense and they won't let it go, they won't choose to forgive, they won't choose to love, and it begins to grow inside of them, that root never stays the same size. It begins to grow and take over their life. And they become bitter, they become angry, they become volatile, they become, they become explosive at some point. Everybody's out to get them. I've seen it in lives. I've seen it how it's ruined families and lives because they've taken this bait of offense. And again, we're seeing this play out today where many have taken the bait, bait and they've taken on offense and then they walk away from their faith in Christ because the enemy's trapped them. That's why holding on to offenses is so dangerous and why Jesus told us to be on guard against it because in the closing point is this, is that living offended encourages us to walk away from Jesus rather than standing firm on the truth so that we're not deceived by anything or anyone. When you and I live offended, we have a blind spot and we can't see the truth because of our pride. And so instead of standing firm on what the Bible says to forgive and love people, making that hard choice, we become deceived by our offenses and people because we can't imagine or believe how they could have done that and we were wronged. That's what Satan wants for you and I, to take the bait to take the offenses and to live offended because it encourages us to drift from our relationship with Jesus and with others and it negatively impacts us in every way. Church, my challenge is if that's where you're at today, I wanna encourage and challenge you to give it to God today and to choose his escape plan by surrendering the offense to the Lord, by making the choice to release it to God because he wants to bring healing and wholeness to your life as you choose to forgive in love. Amen.